Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about Sicelli hashing again, and we're going to get right to coding it. Uh, initially, I'm going to go over the algorithm with some slides, and then we're going to show you pieces of the code, and then you and your partner can go to the lab and finish writing the rest of the code. In previous years, the hard part of this lab has been showing students how to increment the G values and Having done the exercise over the weekend, I realized why the G value increment is so difficult for students. And I'm going to give you two different alternatives for uh, incrementing the G values. In fact, I'm going to start with that conversation right now, and then we'll get on back to the Sicelli. So let's talk for a moment about if we had a relationship between some letters and corresponding values and numbers that they have. Like, let's say A was associated with the number 7, and B was associated with the number 5. If we had to create a list of these relationships, what data structure have we studied that would be the best fit for this kind of relationship? It would be a map. And you can certainly store the G values for Sicelli using a map. In fact, I recommend it. The problem that you're going to run into, the problem that has been the big issue the previous few years when I've given this assignment, is people use a map to store the letters. What, what are these letters? These are the letters that begin and end the words. It'll make more sense when I show you the algorithm. And here are the G values. These are the G values here uh, for each letter. And what's going to happen is that when you get a collision, you have to increment the G values. So what you'll do is you'll increment the G values here. Once you get exhausted to a certain point, it goes back to zero. The next G value goes up. In a map, it's not so easy to do that. Okay, It's not so easy to say, OK, I'm going to keep incrementing this G value. When it goes to zero, I'm going to go to the next G value. The reason why is that the map is these things are not typically in any kind of order. You see what I'm saying? So in CSA, we learned another way, instead of using a map, to represent a relationship between letters and numbers or any two entities. And that was something called a parallel array or a parallel list. We called it parallel list. So let me just show you that again. So let's say I have A here and B here and uh, maybe W and here's X and Z here. And then here, we would have the, the G values for each of these. So A might be like 3, B might be 2, W might be 7, X is 0, Z is 1, or something like that. Now, I've taught you that this is not a good way to store things when you have large lists. What's wrong with this approach? Why is this so much better? There, there are a lot of advantages to this. Can someone tell me some of the advantages versus this? First of all, this guarantees what kind of mathematical relationship. But we have a functional relationship here, right? We can only have a in once in here. If we put it in more than once, it will automatically delete the previous entry and give you the next one. And also, this data structure will scale. If you have hundreds of entries here, if one of them gets corrupted, it'll never corrupt the other entries here. If you accidentally skip the 7 and put the 0 and the 1 here, everything below it will get corrupted. So having parallel lists like this, the solution does not scale. However, for our application here for Sicelli, the, the number of letters that we're going to be working with is relatively small. And we're not particularly worried about the functional relationship here. We can just maintain that in the code. And so what I'm saying to you is I'm offering you the option of instead of storing the G values as a traditional map here, where the incrementing of the values gets more difficult, I'm giving you the option of storing it like this with two arrays. And here, incrementing the values is much easier. You just start incrementing 0, 1, 2, 3. When this gets exhausted, you bring it back to 0. You increment the next one. It's much easier when they're in an array. In fact, we did an exercise earlier, I think, right, where we put them all in an array, and I showed you how to increment them. So you can use this instead of this on this project to make it easier if you want. OK, let's go back to the original assignment now. And let's look at Sicelli. 
these uh, slides were provided by, I think, someone, uh, computer science department at Virginia Tech. I think VT stands for Virginia Tech. Anyway, they put them up on the internet. I'm assuming that they're generally usable, so I've decided to use them. So once again, as a reminder, what we're trying to do is we're trying to take a select group of words. They might be reserved words for a programming language, for example, and we're trying to find some way of mapping them to an array or array indexes so that the size of our array is exactly the size of the list of words that we have so that we don't have any spaces left over in the array and so that we can map using a hash function so that the words can be mapped to indexes of the array in O of k time. And what that will allow us to do when we have a bunch of source code that we need to parse token by token, we can very quickly go through each token and tell if it's a reserved word or not. And the processing time for each token will therefore be O of k, because we'll take that token and pass it through the same hash function, and then we'll be able to look on the table and see if that word is there in the reserve list or not. That's what we're trying to accomplish. So Sicelli is a minimal, perfect hashing scheme. Why is it minimal? Because it only takes as much room as the size of the list. There are no empty spaces, and it's perfect hashing. We want the hashing scheme to be set up in such a way that there are no collisions between any of the words. So how do we do that? That's what we're going to talk about. So the secret to Sicelli is to use this as the hashing scheme. The hashing scheme uses the length of the word. It uses the G value of the beginning letter plus the G value of the ending letter for each word. So if I have a word like this, you can see that the hash value of this word, first we're going to take the length of it, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, so this part will be 5. And then we will take the G value of the letter F, and then we will add it to the G value of the letter E. Now, what are these G values? These G values are going to start off all at zero, right? So basically, the only thing initially, the first run we do, we're just going to consider the lengths of the words. Now, let's say that I had a very short list. Let's say these were my words. Two, let's say I had a very small list like this, right? Now, you can see that the length of this word is three, the length of this word is four, and the length of this word is five. So here you can see that all the lengths are unique. We would never have to worry about G values because we could use just the lengths here to calculate these and we would get unique answers. But how often is it going to happen that all our entries have slightly different lengths? That's never going to happen. So that's why we're going to need these G values. Going back into here. So now we're going to have the length as one parameter, the G value of the starting letter, and the G value of the ending letter. Before we do that, we need to process the words a little bit, and this is where the genius of the Sicelli kind of comes in. So let's look over here, and this is what we're going to do. We're going to say for our exercise that these are the words that we want to hash. Nine. Looks like there's nine words. Three. Yeah, there's nine words. So there's a three-step process. The first thing we want to do is we want to create a set of all the letters that are the beginning and the ending letters for the words. So you can see C is going to be one of the letters we're going to track. So is E. So is O. So is M. So is P. So is A, T, and U. And so those are the letters that you see there. And what you're seeing here is the frequency. How many times does the letter E begin or end one of these words? That's what they're counting. So here you can see E is at the end here. That's one, two, three, four, five, and six. So you can see it appears six times as the beginning or ending letter in these words. You're going to create this relationship now for each of these letters. You're going to count how many words begin or end with that letter, and then you're going to sort the letters based on the frequency. Got that? You can store these in a map if you want. This, these are not G values. These are not G values. Okay? This is a diff we haven't gotten to that yet. This probably be better stored in a map. 
Okay, we're going to give each word a score. We're going to give each word a score. And we're going to score the words by, let's look at this word calliope, for example. Now, what is the frequency of the C? That's going to be a 2. See that? And what's the frequency of the E? That's going to be a 6. So their total score for calliope is 8. So we're going to take the frequency of the beginning letter, the frequency of the end letter, we're just going to add them together to give each word a score. Now, Cleo here, the C has a 2, the O has a 2, so Cleo has a score of 4. You can see that this word, euterpe, euterpe, has the highest score because the E at the beginning has a 6 and the E at the end has a 6. So we add the two 6s together, we get a 12. Now here is the key to Sicelli hashing. We're going to take the words and the, frequ and the scores and we're going to sort the words by the score. So in other words, you can see Euterpe has the highest score, that's why it's at the beginning of the list. And likewise, uh, these other words like Urania, Polyhemia, and Cleo, those are only have the lowest score, they're at the bottom of the list. We're going to say further that if two words have the same score, we're going to further sort them by alphabetical order just so that we all have the same answer. Okay? So here, Euterpe is first with 12. There's no, there's no reason for a second round of, of sorting. Here, Cleo, Polyhymnia, and Urania all have a score of 4. So then we use our secondary sorting criteria and we put them in alphabetical order. You see that, right? Okay. So now we've done the following. We've calculated a set of beginning letters and ending letters for each word. We've calculated how often that letter shows up at the beginning or end of each word. We've used this table to create scores for each word, and we've sorted the words based on their scores.